Hello and welcome to the Aspects of History Summer Festival. Today we're speaking to Giles Milton and he's going to be talking about his new book that's just come out, Checkmate in Berlin. Here it is. It's a fascinating interview about a really interesting period of history. Uh, if you enjoy this, like, subscribe and let people know. Giles, welcome to the Aspects of History Summer Festival. Thank you for having me on. Uh, your new book, Checkmate in Berlin, deals with Berlin at the end of the war and in the immediate years following. Berlin's fate was decided, though, at Yalta in February 1945, when the Allies met with Stalin. What did the Allies hope for and what did they get? So Yalta was the, the, the conference that happened in February 1945, when Roosevelt and Churchill flew into the Crimea to meet with Stalin. And they really wanted to uh, thrash out a post-war order. Um, their, their real aim, both Roosevelt and Churchill, was to preserve the wartime alliance that had been so successful during the war. And Yalta was really to see if they could work out how the world was going to be run in the aftermath of the Second World War. The Allies were desperate to get to Berlin. Among them was Colonel Frank Howley. Can you tell us a bit about him and what was his main objective? Yes, yeah, so of course, um, as the war was drawing to an end, the Soviet forces were the first to arrive in Berlin. They captured the city. And um, what had been decided at the Alta Conference was that Berlin was going to be divided between the Soviets in the east of the city and the Americans and British in the west of the city. The French would come later. Now, each of these sectors required a commandant. And Frank uh, Howley was to be the commandant of the American sector. He was known as Colonel Frank Howling Mad Howley. Fantastic character, a real cowboy that the uh, Americans were parachuting into the American sector. Frank Howley knew how things should be done. They should be done as he intended them to be done. No bureaucracy, no red tape. It was his word and he didn't listen to anyone else. And um, what was sort of fascinating about Frank Howley is that from the, almost from day one, he realised that the Germans were not the enemy anymore. The actual, it was the Russians who were the enemy. And for, from, so, from the very beginning, from the very moment he arrived in Berlin, he realised there was going to be trouble trying to run this great city uh, with the British, later the French, and the Soviets. He just knew it wasn't going to work. And this threw him into conflict immediately with the powers that be in, in, in Washington. So his nickname is... Howling Mad. Howling Mad Howley, yes. So how mad was he? Well, I think it was more like he was sort of a whirlwind of energy, basically. When he came into a place, he wanted to get things done. And in some ways, this is what was needed in Berlin. Berlin in 1945 is, you know, it's a city in absolute ruins. There's no, uh, there's no administration, there's no electricity, no gas, no, nothing is working. So Frank Howley um, is a logistics expert and he knows how to get things done. So from that sense, he was a very sensible choice on the part of the Americans. You know, he, he would be able to clear up the American sector and sort of get things working again. But the problem was that he fundamentally disagreed with everything he was being told from Washington. Uh, uh, so this, this threw him into conflict uh, with his own government. And it would also immediately throw him into conflict with the Soviets in Berlin, and in particular with the Soviet commandant. So Berlin is divided by the Allied and Soviet powers into West Berlin and East Berlin. Uh, the British took control of the middle part of the West. Um, who led the British into Berlin? So, as we say, we have Frank um, Howling Mad Howley leading the Americans in. For the British, we have Brigadier Robert Looney Hind. Only, only the British could come up with a name like that. Um, Looney Hind, like so many Brits who went into Berlin, had spent his sort of formative years in the Raj, in British India. And there was a sense that they were going to run their sector of Berlin as they'd run India. Um, you know, the Germans were sort of to, to be treated as rather annoying natives and they were going to get on with, with uh, how they thought things should be run. But Brigadier Hind, sort of unlike Frank Howley, um, he was prepared to uh, do what his government told him to do. So he got his instructions from Whitehall and from the British military and his instructions were to work as closely with the Soviets as was possible. 
as had been decided at the Yalta conference. And this is what he tries to do. And he really, uh, he runs his sector of Berlin a bit like a, you know, a thoroughly decent cricket umpire. You know, everything he plays by the rules, everything is done correctly. Um, Frank Howard, he can't quite believe that the British, you know, work like this. He said, we're dealing with gangster Russians, you know. We can't, uh, this is not a game of cricket. But that is how uh, Brigadier Hind decided to play it. And it should be said, he was highly effective at the beginning in clearing up the British sector, in uh, cutting down all the disease, the terrible disease that was rife everywhere. You know, you've got to imagine the, 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 the sewage pipes are broken. It, it's, a, it's a terrible mess. And he clears up the British sector and within a very short space of time gets the, thing, gets the show on the road again. So it's spring 1945. Um, Berlin has been uh, a, a battle zone, really, between the Nazis and the Soviets. Yeah. Um, but what was, it, what was it like in the immediate aftermath of the war? I mean, this is a city in ruins. You know, it's been bombarded for years from the air by the uh, RAF and by the American uh, Air Force. And also it's sustained this brutal attack from the Red Army. It's a city completely trashed. Nothing is working. Uh, you know, like I said, all the infrastructure has gone. There is no electricity, there's no gas, there's no running water, there's no government, there's no police force. And the Soviet army, when it's come in, has behaved with absolute brutality. Um, I mean, some viewers might have read A Woman in Berlin, which describes in horrific detail what it was like for women, many, many single women uh, in Berlin at the time when the Red Army came in. There was widespread rape. Uh, there was looting on a grand scale. It was, it was a desperate place to be living. And of course, the, the Russians had come in uh, eight weeks before the Western Allies came into the city. And this had given them, them the opportunity to loot and pillage on a grand scale. So, you know, Berlin, one of the great cultural centres of Europe, it had museums stashed with treasures from across the world. All of those were carted up and, create, and, and taken off to Moscow. Um, this was loot unlike anywhere had ever been looted before. The Russians had also looted all the industrial plants, many of which were in the western sector of Berlin, the, the sectors that are due to fall into American and British hands. They'd gone into the factories and they'd simply stripped out all the machinery. So uh, when the Americans and British finally arrive in Berlin, they find that their sectors, there's nothing left. It's all being crated off and taken back to Moscow. Once the Allies arrive in their sectors, does the, uh, the looting from the Soviets stop the moment they arrive, or is there any more um, conflict between the two sides in their own sectors? And I'm talking about the Allied sectors. Yeah, well, this is, a, this is a big problem, because although the city's been divided up into sectors, soldiers and anyone can cross between the sectors. And one of the, the, the biggest problems facing both the British and Americans is Red Army troops coming into their sectors where all these bars and nightclubs had sprung up all, almost immediately and coming in, having a good time, getting drunk and causing you know, violence. And, and in a very short space of time, there are fights on the street, there are gun battles taking place between Americans and British and, the, and their Soviet opposite numbers. It's chaotic. And, and, and this sort of a, there's this real sort of gangster feel to the city. Uh, you know, it's a bit like uh, the film The Third Man, where all sorts of things are going on uh, beneath the surface. This is happening in, in Berlin, and it's going to become a real problem, particularly because, um, certainly for the British and American soldiers, they're lords of all they survey. They've got, uh, they've got endless sources of money, revenue, they've got cigarettes, they've got access to everything that Germans need, desperately need, Berliners are, uh, desperately need. So they become incredibly powerful, they can do what they want. Um, and the, this black market springs up, the crime is rife, and very soon there are, as I said, there are clashes between the Western soldiers and the Red Army. So Berlin is divided, but it's actually within East Germany, and obviously there's West Germany. Could you just talk about the division of, of Germany itself? Yes, yeah, so at Yalta, uh, the Allies with Stalin have decided not only to, to divide up Berlin between them, but also Germany itself. And it works along a similar principle. So the eastern side of Germany is going to be run by the Soviets, and the western side of Germany is going to be run by the British and Americans, and, and, and afterwards the French as well come in. Now, this all sounds, you know, well and good, but you've got to remember that Berlin is deep within the Soviet sector of occupied Germany. So this means it's sort of an island um, in a sea of red. So the, the Western districts 
of Berlin can only be accessed from West Germany by a one uh, rail link and one road link. This is all well and good while the Allies remain on good terms with Stalin and the Soviets. But if relationships break down, how easy it will be for the Soviets to cut the road and rail links and Berlin is left as an island. You'll have the Western sectors of Berlin completely cut off from the rest of Western Germany. Um, and this could, you know, potentially for the future, spell disaster for the Western Allies. Yes, we'll get on to that later, actually. But um, what I'm interested in is you mentioned the French came in later. Could you just uh, talk a little bit about that? Because they weren't originally going to be one of the powers until they were invited in by the, uh, the, two, the Americans and the British, is that right? Yes, they were. But Stalin did not want the French involved. He said, well, they did nothing in this war. They just opened the gates to the enemy. Why should they have anything? And Churchill and Roosevelt uh, argued with Stalin and said, you know, maybe you should be a little bit more reasonable about this. And in the end, Stalin said, OK, well, the, the French can have a section of Germany and of, uh, and of Berlin as long as it's carved from your zones. They're not having any Soviet territory. So uh, the French were given an area of North Berlin, and Northwest Berlin, one of the uh, most undesirable areas uh, uh, of uh, Berlin. And in fact, in the ensuing sort of story and showdown that follows between the West and the Soviets, the French actually have very little influence. It really is the Americans and British who dominate the agenda. So um, they have a, a minor role to play in what happened over the next sort of five years in Berlin. So the Soviets were determined to control the city uh, and part of their strategy, which you describe in the book, was to infiltrate Berlin with revolutionaries. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So um, during the course of the war, a handful of German communists had spent their wartime in Moscow and got very close to Stalin. And the idea was to send this little network of revolutionaries into Berlin, just on, on the tails of the Red Army. And they were there to set up a communist infrastructure within the city before the Western Allies got there. So that all the local administrations, the, the local mayoral, mayoral offices, um, and, and very importantly, the police, would already be in the hands of German communists by the time the Western Allies uh, came in. They were led by a chap called Walter Ulbricht, who is, um, he sort of became a model for those grim-faced, you know, uh, Eastern uh, European rulers that I remember in my childhood. Walter Ulbricht, you know, he was utterly devoid of any humour, any humanity whatsoever. But he was pretty effective as a, as a, as a revolutionary communist. He got into Berlin just days after the Red Army had captured the city and began setting up this secret communist infrastructure. Notably, he takes control of the police and he puts in command of the police a former um, Pan Wehrmacht panzer captain called Paul Markgraft, who was a diehard Nazi, who realised that when the Germans had, war uh, had lost the war, I might as well become a communist, that's probably the best thing to do, which he does, and he's in placed in charge of the Berlin police. So by the time the Americans and British arrive in the city, there's this sort of secret network of communists um, controlling various aspects of the administration and the police. And this is going to prove a real problem for the likes of Frank Howley and Brigadier Looney Hind. So Potsdam, which took place in July 1945, uh, there was a general election in the UK which removed Churchill and Attlee replaced him. And what was at stake for the Allies at this conference? So Pots, the idea of Potsdam was really to build on what had been decided at Yalta. But the big problem by this stage is that Stalin's Red Army is in control of most of Eastern and Central Europe. So Stalin holds all the cards, basically. And, and, and the other weakness, well, the, the Western Allies have two major weaknesses. One is that President Roosevelt has died and President Truman has been, uh, become president in his place. President Truman, who's only ever left America once before and is, uh, has no knowledge of, of foreign affairs at all, really. And also, like you say, Churchill has lost the election in 1945 and Clement Attlee comes in his place. Halfway through the Potsdam Conference, they changed the team. Uh, the one advantage the British have is their foreign secretary, the pugnacious Ernest Bevin, who is determined to fight Britain's corner. But frankly, by the time the new British team arrive, it's too late. Stalin has really walked over the Western Allies. He's got everything he wants, including a complete political domination of Eastern and Central Europe. He's got large chunks of Poland, which he also wants. 
And the Western Allies leave realising that perhaps Stalin has indeed got the upper hand. So Stalin's it was in many ways the victor of both Yalta and Potsdam, would that be fair to say? I think Stalin has played his cards extremely well and he has got everything he wants. And in fact, I read accounts by Soviet diplomats they couldn't quite believe what they'd won, the concessions they'd won at, at Potsdam. They were expecting much tougher negotiations on the part of the Americans and British, and they felt they, they'd won absolutely everything they wanted. So in the aftermath of the horrific conflict, a divided city, half of it under Soviet control, what was life like for the Berliners? Life was extremely difficult. Um, it, it's fortunate that a number of Berliners uh, kept De uh, detailed uh, daily diaries of what life was like at the time. And one of them was uh, this woman called Ruth Andreas Friedrich, who'd worked for the German resistance actually during the war. She kept this diary of just how awful life was. Um, there was no food, uh, water you had to get from standpipes. Um, well, there, there was very strict rationing. 1,300 calories a day, that is not a lot in a Berlin winter. The winter of 1946, for example, the temperatures fell down to, uh, went down to minus 26. No one's got glass in their windows. It's absolutely a desperate situation to be living in. And life is really, really hard for the Berliners. You have to contrast this with the allied garrisons and the military governments in the Western sectors and indeed the Soviet sector, where life is pretty fantastic. There's endless food, there's bountiful quantities of alcohol, and they are living the high life. The clubs that have been set up, the Ritzy, the Femina, these are places where they can go. They fraternize with the local German women. The, the Berlin women are desperate, you know, they've got nothing, and they, they feel that their future lies in the hands, perhaps, or, or you know, in the arms of the, German, of the uh, Allied soldiers. So life is pretty good if you're posted to Berlin as a Westerner. It's pretty grim if you're a Berliner on the ground there. And the Berlin of East and West, with four sectors, how did all of that work between the British, the French, the Americans, and then of course the Soviets? Well, the city is divided into four, but actually you can cross relatively easily between the four sectors. I'm sure people will have seen photos of those sectors. You are now leaving the British sector or you are now leaving the American sector. You could cross freely between the sectors in the beginning. But as tensions uh, went on the, on the rise, as things became more complicated between the Western Allies and the Soviets, the city gradually began to split into two component parts and it became increasingly dangerous to cross uh, into, into the Soviet sector. On the American side, you have these two strong characters. We've mentioned uh, Mad, Frank Howling Mad Howley, um, but there's also Lucius Clay, uh, his, I believe his boss. Um, who was Clay and why did the two men have such a tense relationship? Yeah, so just as each sector of Berlin has a commandant, each area of occupied, each zone of occupied Germany has um, a military governor. And so uh, Lu uh, uh, Frank Howley is in charge of the American sector of Berlin. Lucius Clay is in charge of the occupied zone, American occupied zone of Germany. So effectively, Lucius Clay is Frank Howley's boss. And herein lies the problem. Because as I said, Frank Howley views the Soviets as the enemy. Lucius Clay is under strict orders to deal with them as an ally. And this puts Clay and Howley into a headlong conflict. They don't see eye to eye on anything at all. And it's going to cause real problems in the early days where they are totally at loggerheads. So we move to a situation where the relationship between the Allies and the Soviets develops into something worse than the original tensions. You, was there a, a particular point or an incident that, that caused this, or was it a, 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 de a gradual degradation of, of, of the relationship? Well, gradually things are breaking down on the ground in Berlin. It's, it's, it's turning nasty on the streets. But there are three things really that happen in early 1946 which transform everything. First of all, Churchill delivers his famous Iron Curtain speech uh, in America. President Truman introduces him and he gives this speech, which we, we tend to forget now, 
just how controversial this was. I mean, uh, it caused absolute uproar because Churchill was effectively saying the Soviets are now the enemy. And this played very badly in the American media. It played very badly in Britain as well. So deeply controversial thing to be to say. The second thing that happened almost simultaneously is that this, uh, this uh, diplomat, Igor Gazenko, working for the Soviet embassy in Canada, he defects. And he defects with dramatic news that the Soviets have been, uh, uh, have been spying uh, and inf infiltrating the nuclear program in, in North America, and they've carried away endless nu nuclear secrets. This, is, this is causes, again, absolute, it, it causes astonishment in, in Washington, in, uh, in Canada, and in Great, Great Britain, uh, that the Soviets, this, they're supposed to be a, 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 an ally, have actually been stealing nuclear secrets. That's the, that, the second big thing that happens in the spring of 1946. And the third big thing, is that George Kennan, who works for the uh, American embassy in Moscow, is, he's a brilliant uh, intellectual. He's been in Moscow for many years and he knows Stalin personally. He's asked to write an appraisal of what he thinks is taking place. And he writes uh, what was to become extremely famous in America, his long telegram. His long telegram sets it out as he sees it. And as he sees it, the Soviets are now the enemy. And this, uh, this really causes dynamite uh, in Washington when combined with Churchill's speech and the defection of Guzenko. And really, at this point, American policy and British policy is turned on its head. Um, there is, the Soviets are no longer viewed as a reliable wartime ally. The alliance is over. They become the enemy. And we have two things that come out of this, which the first is the Truman Doctrine and the second is the Marshall Plan. The Truman Doctrine, a complete turnabout of, uh, of American foreign policy, says that the America is going to offer support to any country under threat from Soviet domination. And the Marshall Plan is a sort of a financial equivalent of that, is that uh, George Marshall's plan is to supply uh, billions of dollars, pour it into uh, Germany and into the rest of Europe to rebuild Europe. So the Americans and British have gone into Germany with the idea, uh, alongside the Soviets, of dismantling the country completely. Suddenly, everything changes. They want to rebuild Germany, but they're only going to rebuild Western Germany. And so at this point, 46, 47, we see a dramatic change in policy. And we see also a dramatic change in the sort of uh, geopolitics of the region, that suddenly Germany splits into two component parts, one Soviet, and one dominated by the Western Allies. So 1946-47, you've mentioned these events that are taking place outside of Germany that is obviously mm. influencing Germany and, the, uh, and Western Europe. Yeah. But for Berliners over that winter, could you talk a little bit more about what they went through? Yeah, I mean, th th there's very little food. They're extremely hungry, um, which is just about bearable in the summer months. But the winter of 46, 47 is one of the harshest winters on record. The temperature falls to minus 26 Celsius. Uh, this is, uh, imagine people living in ruined houses with no windows, certainly no heating. It's, it's a bitterly cold winter. And the only way to survive is for Berliners to go uh, walk down into the Tiergarten. They, they start hacking down the linden trees, the you know, 300 year old trees uh, for which the Tiergarten is famous and dragging the wood home in order to you know, try and have some sort of heating. There is very, very limited electricity, often only two hours a day or rather two hours a night. They never know when it's gonna come on, but when they do, they immediately have to get up and cook their meal for the next day in, in that window of opportunity. There's no running water for many places, so they're still getting water from standpipes. They have to queue for hours in, you know, in minus 26 for their, uh, to fill their water buckets. It's a really tough time, and, and many, many Berliners uh, die of hypothermia, and many also commit suicide at this time. So the world has changed as a result of those uh, developments in 46. The Berliners have gone through this horrific winter. We then move to a further degradation and, and that resulted in the requirement for the Berlin airlift. Could you just talk about how we got there, what, what caused the airlift, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the airlift itself. 
Yeah, so we have the, the, the Russian revolutionaries have been trying to carve out, uh, really take control of Berlin. This is their great idea. And they want to do it through the, uh, through the ballot box. But this uh, fails miserably in the elections of October 1946. It doesn't work. They will never win the hearts and minds of Berliners, especially after what the, the atrocities committed by the Red Army. But Stalin, nevertheless, he really wants to boot the Western Allies out of Berlin and take control of the entire city. Uh, he also, uh, his long-term plan is to boot the Western Allies out of Western Germany as well. But he wants to start with Berlin. And so uh, realising that he's never going to be able to uh, seize power through the ballot box, he realises he needs to take more dramatic action. And this is where we, he starts laying the groundwork for the Berlin blockade. So the blockade resulted in the airlift, which was a huge logistical task. Whose idea was it? And who are the characters who manage the whole operation? Yeah, so just to set the, the scenes of the blockade, um, we mentioned earlier that the only links into, into Berlin was a railway link and a road link. The Soviets block these. They, so basically, by doing that, they cut off any possibility of the Western Allies getting supplies into their sectors of Berlin. So this means that their garrisons, several tens of thousands of men, are without any supplies. But more to the point, the Western Allies have got 2.4 million Berliners that they, that they have to keep fed, watered and, and supplied. How are they going to do this? It seems absolutely impossible. They need um, an absolute minimum of 4,500 tonnes of food and supplies every day need to arrive in Berlin. An absolute minimum for subsistence. If they can only fly things in, because this looks like the only um, feasible way of getting supplies into Berlin, to do it by plane. Well, a Dakota, which was the plane that they had at the time, could only carry two and a half, thousand, uh, two and a half tons of supplies. This is an impossible task. They're never going to be able to do it. Except for, um, uh, we always, in times of crisis, need a British boffin to step to the fore. And uh, this is what, exactly what happens. Uh, Reginald Waite, is a mathematical genius, never, you know, never uh, leaves home without his uh, slide rule. And he sits down with his slide rule and a table of logarithms, and he begins to try and find, work out if a mathematical solution is possible to the crisis. And he realises that there are eight airfields in Western Germany that could be used to fly supplies into the two airfields in West Berlin. And um, gradually he builds up a blueprint for how this inconceivable thing could actually be made to work. He works it all out, mathematical formulas and everything, takes it to the British commandant uh, of, of West Berlin, who looks at it and says, this is absolutely impossible, preposterous, don't be ridiculous. He takes it to the military governor of uh, uh, British occupied Germany, who says, no, don't be, this is ludicrous, don't be, don't be ridiculous. He then, his last throw of the dice, he takes it to the, uh, the, the American, com, uh, American military governor, Lucius Clay, who looks at it, thinks this is a work of genius and says, let's give it a go. And really at that point, uh, we're talking about June of 1948, suddenly the Americans and then the British swing into action. And this is, it's an amazing story because they basically bring in planes from across the world, hundreds and hundreds of planes from Honolulu, from Hawaii, from Alaska, from British dominions and colonies, from across the world. They, planes are brought into West Germany and they're gonna try and make this thing work. So they're using Reginald Waite's blueprint and the Americans bring in a specialist called General Tonnage Tunner, whose expertise is airlifts, and they decide to give this a go. They're gonna supply 2.4 million Berliners uh, using only two airfields in West Berlin, having to fly in a minimum of 4,500 tonnes every single day, an extraordinary undertaking that is set in motion. So this is an incredible operation. With, with that comes huge risk, and, and it very nearly failed. So why was that? Well, the risks are twofold. I mean, one of the big problems is the Soviets are doing everything they can to stop the Allies being able to land supplies in Berlin. So they fly yak fighters uh, across the Allied uh, flight paths into Berlin. They set up massive searchlights at night to try and blind the pilots as they land. But the, uh, the Allies, uh, this has been a carefully worked out operation. The Allies, it's run like clockwork. Uh, they fly in uh, on five different levels, the planes are flying in. 
They're a few hundred feet apart. They're landing every 90 seconds into the two airports. It's, it's just a superbly well-organized uh, well operation. Nothing has ever been done like this before. The Americans and British are helped by General von Röden, who was in Stalingrad. He worked for the Luftwaffe, and he has great experience of, of, of airlifts. And he, um, to, uh, this raised quite a few eyebrows, it has to be said at the time, but he lends the support of all his Luftwaffe engineers to uh, help maintain the planes of the Allies. And so, um, and so the airlift uh, gets underway. The great difficulty and the great headache really and problem, it comes in November, you know, Berlin, for people who've been to Berlin in winter, it's not a pleasant place to be. It's cold, it's snowbound, and it's often, more importantly, fogbound. And this causes absolute chaos to an, air, to an airlift that is running like clock, has to run like clockwork. Uh, when the fog comes down, it's a disaster. And really, by December, January, January 1949, it looks like the airlift is actually going to fail. But suddenly the weather changes, the fog lifts, and the Allies are triumphant. Not only are they bringing in the daily minimum of four and a half thousand tons a day, but they actually get up to twelve and a half thousand tons. And this is a, the greatest triumph of all, really, that they, they have, they've cracked it. They know how to do this. So your book, Strapline, is uh, the showdown that shaped the world, shaped the modern world, did it? It really did. You know, the, what happened in Berlin really... Uh, is a microcosm of everything that is happening at the beginning of the Cold War. Europe is splitting into two. It's splitting down the line that Churchill talked about in his Iron Curtain speech. And really, uh, 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 there are two major upshots of what happened in Berlin. The first is that Germany splits into two. You have the, the Federal Republic in the West and the so-called Democratic Public Republic in the East. So uh, Germany and, of course, Europe splits down the uh, Iron Curtain. But um, equally importantly, in fact, if not more importantly, at the time, the very tail end of the Berlin airlift, the Western Allies realise they need to form some sort of military pact to counter the potential threat that the Soviet Union represents to Western Europe. They set up NATO and NATO changes everything because the fundamental founding principle of NATO is that the, if the Soviet Union attack one country, it's considered as an attack on all. And everyone in the West believes that the Soviet Union, much as they're prepared to risk a lot, they will never risk a war in which they cannot be guaranteed to win. And thus begins the Cold War, really, the great standoff which is going to last for the next three, four decades. Um, so what happened in Berlin, you know, between 1945 and 1949 really sets a shape on post-war Europe. Well, Giles, it's an extraordinary story, uh, an incredible book. I just have one final question for you. Um, are you working on something new at the moment? I am just starting, uh, uh, working on a new idea, uh, which will involve Stalin and some key allied players very close to him uh, during the Second World War. Wonderful. Well, I hope you can come back and speak to us about that. Thank I'd love to. Much. Thank you very much for having me on. Thanks. Yeah.